This is a copy of what the first Bible printed in English in America looked like. This Bible was printed by the U.S. Congress in 1782. In the records, it says that this Bible was, quote, a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of our schools, end quote. So the first Bible printed in America in English was printed by Congress for the use of our schools. It's worse than that. In the front of the cover, it says that Congress resolved the United States and Congress assembled recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. So the first Bible printed in English in America was done by the guys who signed the documents, endorsed by Congress, and done for the use of schools. And we're going to be told that they don't want any kind of religion and education. They don't want voluntary prayer. No, it doesn't make sense. This document by itself is fairly significant. But in 1830, Congress commissioned these four paintings over here to recapture what the official record said was the Christian history of the United States. So in these four paintings, you have really a span of several hundred years. If I take you through them chronologically, the first is back there, Columbus, landing in the Western world in 1492. Uh, they got out, they knelt down, they had a prayer service. You see the cross they have. They named the land where they had landed San Salvador, meaning Holy Savior, which tells you something of the thinking that was going on then. You come back over my shoulder here, this is the baptism of Pocahontas in Jamestown, and this was in 1613. Uh, over here, the fourth painting is 1620. This is the embarkation of the pilgrims coming to America. You see them gathered around the Bible there. You see the prayer meeting they're having. Now, if you just take those four paintings right there, those four paintings in this great secular hall of government, those four paintings represent two prayer meetings, a Bible study, and a baptism, which is not bad for a secular building. As a matter of fact, you're standing in what, in 1857, was the largest church in the United States, is the U.S. Capitol. Back on December the 4th of 1800, uh, members of Congress, members of the Senate, Thomas Jefferson was over the Senate, you had John Trumbull over the House. They decided that on Sundays we would turn, turn the Capitol building into a church building. And starting on Sunday, we started having services in the Capitol. Now, six weeks after that, Thomas Jefferson became President of the United States. But for his eight years as president, he went to church here at the U.S. Capitol, listened to the sermons here at the Capitol, and being commander-in-chief, he decided he could help the worship here at the Capitol. He ordered the Marine Corps Band to come play the worship services at the Capitol. Now, that'd be kind of cool having the Marine Corps Band as your worship band, you know, in church. That church went for the better part of a century, and by 1857, there were 2,000 people a week that went to church in the Hall of the House of Representatives. In addition to that, there were four other churches that met at the Capitol. First Congregational, was this was their church home, as was First Presbyterian, as was Capitol Hill Presbyterian. Churches met here. There was nothing secular or seen to be secular about this building until the last 30, 40, 50 years. I'm revived. I feel different. I feel that I'll go home and know how to pray. Last night we walked around the Capitol. I spent more time crying and weeping listening to Brother David as he spoke about our government and the documents that he held up. And I said, Lord, I said, how can I be used? The David Barton tour of the Capitol, that was awesome. It was, it was enlightening. It was awesome. There was so much that I didn't know. It opened up our eyes where the media will only give you one side, but we got to see what America was built on. And even though we knew it, we got to see in depth. And just the information that he gave us, just it blew my mind. Though I've lived in the general area for over 20 years now, I'd never been inside the Capitol before. I'm within two and a half hours of the Capitol. And, uh, and uh, David, the leader was just phenomenal. So One of the highlights for me was going to the Capitol building and getting some history about what's been going on uh, as far as how this nation was started. And, and we've been lied to, and that's the, the honest to God truth. And just not and knowing that has really, I'm a little angry about it. And, uh, and I'm at a point of, of getting the education that I need. You see the statue to the left of the door over there, that white marble statue? That is President James A. Garfield. President Garfield uh, was one of the young major generals in the Civil War. Uh, he was a war hero. He became Speaker of the House. He became the 20th President of the United States. And by the way, uh, that man founded Howard University. Uh, General O.O. O. Howard took it over after he founded it. Just a really cool guy. But what we never hear about that President of the United States is that he was a minister during the Second Great Awakening. Uh, this is actually one of his letters, signed James A. Garfield, 1858. 
In this letter, President Garfield recounts that he had just finished preaching a revival service where that he preached the gospel 19 times in the revival. He says as a result of his preaching, he said that 34 folks came to Christ and he baptized 31 of them. Now that doesn't seem like a typical presidential activity today. That's what we used to do with presidents in the past. Again, you'd walk through, you'd see that statue, you'd think, oh, there's a president. You'd never think there's a minister. We've so compartmentalized Christianity in such a small box that we don't realize our military leaders, our, our ministers, our educators, our, our, our presidents used to be ministers. That's why I say about one-fourth of these statues are ministers of the gospel. Uh, the church has been silent. It's been a real eye-opener to see, uh, you know, the forefathers of our faith in this country, how they engaged the culture, they had a positive impact on the culture, and really we're all the beneficiaries of that generations later. Now, if you come back to these guys right here, these 56 guys right here are the ones that create all the problem with religious expression public today. You see, every time we go into a public setting on a court case, and what's happened is we've all been trained to recognize the two least religious founding fathers. We can all find Jefferson and Franklin, and everybody else was just like them. Really. I mean, most people have no clue that Jefferson started church in the U.S. Capitol that it went for a century. Most people have, have no clue that Thomas Jefferson in 1803 negotiated a treaty with the Kaskasi Indians in which Jefferson put federal funds to pay for missionaries to go evangelize the Indians and gave federal funds so that after they were converted, we'd build them churches in which to worship. And that's our least religious founding father, okay, which tells you something about the others. Out of the 56 guys who signed the Declaration, you have 29 who held seminary or Bible school degrees. My first visit to FRC uh, was that of going through the Capitol tour with David Barton. And that changed my life because in that tour, we learned and found out things about this nation and the founding of this nation that are holy and strictly Christian from the Bible. And you need to know that, you need to hear about that. So I encourage you, make FRC a destination the Family Research Council has given us pastors a voice that goes way beyond our pulpit.